Targeting Truth, Spiritual GPS. As we start our new series on spiritual GPS, there are a few questions that we must ask. Where am I? What is my current location? And where am I going? What is my intended destination? Today we want to talk about our destination, heaven. How do I get there? One time Jesus had a discussion with his disciples. Thomas said to him, Lord, we do not know where you are going. How do we know the way? Jesus said to him, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father but through me. This is a very exclusive statement and offends many people. In our postmodern society, it's not popular to believe in absolutes. The cry for tolerance has far outspoken any plea for truth. In a world full of opinions, every opinion has equal weight, except one that would claim that it is the right one. Any idea of truth is limited to finding the truth inside one's own head. Most people view religion from this false perspective. The idea is that anything you believe is okay, as long as it works for you. If it helps you be a better person, then it must be good. There are many paths to heaven, it is said, so find the one that works for you. However, we run into a serious logical problem by attempting to hold this view. This problem is well illustrated by a discussion I once had with a very intelligent young lady named Anna. Anna had been well educated in our university system and subscribed to the idea that there are no absolutes. At one particular hot point in our discussion, she strongly stated, But Luke, there's no such thing as truth. I smiled at her and asked her, Is that the truth? Her only response was a sheepish grin. Is there such a thing as truth? Is there one God, no God, or many gods? Is there one way that leads to heaven, or are there multiple paths? Is there a heaven, and is there a hell? How would we know? The only way we could know for sure is if the one God has spoken to us in a manner that we can understand. The Bible claims that there is one true God. The Bible claims that it is God's word, that indeed God lives and that he has spoken. In past episodes, we've presented proof that establishes that the Bible is indeed the word of God. Now the question is, what does the Bible say? The Bible says that Jesus came as God in the flesh to communicate clearly to us. Jesus doesn't just claim to be a prophet. He claims to be the prophet. He isn't just a good moral teacher. He's the only one who can define morality. He isn't just a path to heaven. He is the only path. Jesus didn't just come to tell the truth. He is the truth. I asked my friend Anna another question. If I hold up one finger and then I hold up another, how many are there now? Of course, we all know that one plus one equals two. However, Anna knew where this conversation was headed, so she said, well, maybe I see three. My response? If you see three, then you need to get your eyes fixed. A person's inability to see correctly doesn't change the truth. Jesus came, among other reasons, to help us who are blind to be able to see. Jesus came to fix our eyesight so that we can see the truth and acknowledge it. With Jesus, there is no neutrality. He doesn't allow us to relegate him to the list of good teachers. Have you seen his teachings? It has been well said, Jesus is either a liar or a lunatic or Lord. Study Jesus' teachings and come to know for yourself, who is he? Do his claims stand up to honest scrutiny? If so, then we are compelled to follow him, for he is the way, the truth, and the life. The lie is that many paths lead to heaven and that most people are going there. The truth is that Jesus is the only way to heaven, and few are the people who will truly follow. Will you follow the truth? Join us for our next episode, Ignorance Isn't Bliss. Targeting Truth, Spiritual GPS. Have you ever heard the saying that ignorance is bliss? Maybe you've thought, what I don't know can't hurt me. Both of these thoughts are misguided and destructive. We see this play out in our life here on earth. There's no bliss in being ignorant of a fire that's burning down our house. If I don't know that I have cancer, that doesn't keep the cancer from silently killing me. On the contrary, if we knew that either of these things was happening, 
we might be able to do something to minimize our losses. As a matter of fact, oftentimes our greatest harm comes as a result of our ignorance. The Bible consistently makes the case that God holds us accountable to know Him and to know His ways. On the negative side, God says in Hosea 4 verse 6, My people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. This was true of the nation of Israel as they fell into captivity to the Assyrians, and it also holds true for each one of us at an individual level. As 2 Thessalonians 1, 7-8 maintains, Jesus is going to punish those who do not know God. We have an obligation to come to the knowledge of the truth. On the positive side, the Bible also communicates that there is a reward for those who do come to know God. Jesus said in John 8, 31-32, If you abide in my word, then you are truly disciples of mine, and you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. Without a knowledge of truth, slavery reigns. But when we know the truth, liberty abounds. Which do you prefer? I think that most people would want to choose freedom over slavery, yet most people do not make this choice. Why is that? Because freedom isn't free. The reality is that most people aren't willing to pay the price necessary for freedom. Most people aren't willing to search and research. Most people are lazy, and laziness leaves the hard digging up to somebody else. The problem is that this refusal to search for the truth has an even higher price than freedom. It will cost you your eternal soul. Winston Churchill well described the difficulty in searching out the truth. He said, In wartime, truth is so precious that she should always be attended by a bodyguard of lies. We are in a spiritual war, and lies are everywhere. In order to find the truth, you must be willing to fight through all of the deception. In order to know what God requires for salvation, you must look past all of the man-made falsehoods that attempt to shortcut the way. There's one other major difficulty in finding the truth. It may be the greatest barrier of all. That barrier is you and me. Sometimes the truth hurts. It can be difficult to look in the mirror and be honest about our current condition. However, we should imitate Patrick Henry's resolve when the colonies were contemplating independence. He said, For my part, whatever anguish of spirit it may cost, I am willing to know the whole truth to know the worst, and to provide for it. How about you and your spiritual life? Are you willing to face the hard facts about your current condition? Are you willing to admit that you are in need of salvation? Are you willing to admit that maybe all you've done in reference to your salvation is to listen to the words of men? Can you summon up the courage to ask the tough questions and accept the real answers? The important question here is, what does the Bible say? Don't let yourself off the hook. You need to know. The lie is that ignorance is bliss, that what I don't know can't hurt me. The truth is that God will hold you accountable for what you don't know. Ignorance isn't bliss. Search and research. The truth shall set you free. Join us for our next episode, The Sinner's Prayer. In the Bible, nowhere. Targeting Truth, Spiritual GPS. Have you ever heard of the sinner's prayer? The one where you confess you're a sinner and then you ask Jesus into your heart? Maybe you have even recited this prayer in hopes of being saved. But here's something to consider. You won't find this prayer in the Bible anywhere. Today we're going to look at the real problem of sin. Once we understand the problem, we will also see why the sinner's prayer is no solution. Unfortunately, in our world, sin is normal. We're sinners, and we're surrounded by sinners. When sin is the norm, one of the natural tendencies is to blow it off, to say that it's no big deal. However, nothing could be further from the truth. Sin is a really big deal. And we can't even begin to talk about the solution of this problem until we've come to grips with the severity of the problem. The harsh reality is that sin separates us from God. Let's go back to the Garden of Eden. Adam and Eve were full of life and joy in the garden. And there was only one rule. 
God said that they could eat from any tree in Eden, except the one in the middle of the garden. The fruit of this tree was the knowledge of good and evil. God said, For in the day that you eat from it, you shall surely die. Did you catch that? The consequence of disobedience to God is death. Of course, the devil, the great deceiver, came along with a different story. Satan said, You surely shall not die. Adam and Eve caved in to the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the boastful pride of life. They saw that the tree was good for food. They saw that it was a delight to the eyes. They saw that the tree was desirable to make them wise. And they ate. Satan sold the lie, Be your own God. And they bought. Now Adam and Eve didn't die physically that day, but they died just as God said they would. They died a spiritual death as they were separated from God. They lost access to walk and talk with God. They were banished from the tree of life. Spiritual death was immediate and physical death began to set in. The truth of the matter is that each one of us has undergone the same experience encountered by Adam and Eve. We too started as innocent babies in fellowship with God. But we fell for the lie and we chose to be our own God. Then we died. We were separated from God. We partook of the worst drug of all, spiritual LSD, lust, sin, death. As James 1, 14 through 15 says, But each one is tempted when he is carried away and enticed by his own lust. Then when lust is conceived, it gives birth to sin. And when sin is accomplished, it brings forth death. This separation between us and God is no minor schism. It's a gulf that spans the distance from hell to heaven. This isn't something that we can resolve on our own. So how do we get this problem fixed? The standard religious answer is to say the sinner's prayer. But does that really work? Let's think for a second. When Adam and Eve sinned, they lost access to walk and talk with God. Guess what? When you sinned, you also forfeited the right to be heard by God. Isaiah 59 verses 1 and 2 is very clear. Behold, the Lord's hand is not so short that it cannot save, neither is his ear so dull that it cannot hear. But your iniquities have made a separation between you and your God, and your sins have hidden his face from you, so that he does not hear. In other words, the sinner's prayer doesn't work. It can't work. Search the scriptures. You won't find one example in the New Testament of a person being saved through a prayer. You can't find someone accepting Jesus into their heart through prayer. It isn't in the Bible. And the idea of the sinner's prayer actually is in direct conflict with what the Bible teaches about the problem of sin. Sin is a big deal. Sin is a major problem, and we can't solve this problem by avoiding it. We first need to recognize the serious predicament that we're in. Then we need to turn to the Bible for God's solution. We will get to the good news in future episodes, but today our focus is on the problem. The lie is that the problem of sin can be resolved simply through the sinner's prayer. The truth is that sin has separated us from God, and only Christ can set the terms for the repair of this relationship. Join us for our next episode, What About Children? Targeting Truth, Spiritual GPS We've seen the problem of sin is real. Separation from God is the most serious condition in which a person could be found. There's a tendency to put only the worst sinners in that category so that we can feel safe. Surely Hitler, child abusers, murderers, those guys are headed for hell. But I'm a good guy. I'm okay. That's wrong. The scripture doesn't let us off the hook. Romans 3.23 says, For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. This is quite scary for the honest person to realize that I'm separated from God, to realize that God doesn't hear my prayers, to understand that if I died right now, I'm destined for hell. This is something that I must get resolved, and the sooner the better. However, there's a nagging question in the back of my mind before I deal with myself. What about children? Where do they stand with God? Common sense would tell us that a baby's born innocent. Common sense says that only adults would be accountable before God. Truth and common sense usually match up. 
So the curious ask, what does the Bible say? A primary doctrine that's taught in the religious realm is called original sin. The idea behind this teaching is that when Adam sinned, every descendant from that time on inherited his sin. Thus, this doctrine maintains, we're born sinners and as such are in trouble with God. The common verse used to support this doctrine is Romans 5.12. Therefore, just as through one man sin entered into the world, and death through sin, and so death spread to all men, because all sinned. However, notice that this verse doesn't say that we're all accountable for Adam's sin. On the contrary, we are accountable because all sinned. There's a principle of God's justice revealed throughout Scripture that a person is accountable only for his or her own sin. Ezekiel 18.20 says, The person who sins will die. The son will not bear the punishment for the father's iniquity, nor will the father bear the punishment for the son's iniquity. The righteousness of the righteous will be upon himself, and the wickedness of the wicked will be upon himself. The Bible is actually very clear that children stand innocent before God. Jesus said in Matthew 18, 3, Truly I say to you, unless you are converted and become like children, you shall not enter the kingdom of heaven. Notice that Jesus says that when we are converted, we become like children. The implication is that children are in good standing with God. Jesus follows up later in this discussion, saying of little ones, that their angels in heaven continually behold the face of my Father who is in heaven. Children are innocent, and God hears their prayers. The Apostle Paul gives us a view into his personal journey into accountability before God. In Romans 7, 9, he says, And I was once alive apart from the law, but when the commandment came, sin became alive, and I died. The law, including the Ten Commandments, was in existence approximately 1,500 years before the birth of Paul. Yet there was a point in Paul's life where he was alive to God apart from the law. When the commandment came, in other words, at the age Paul was accountable and this commandment applied to him, sin then became alive and he died. What was true of Paul is applicable to every individual of the human race. We're each born into this world in fellowship with God. Then we grow up. At some point, we reach an adult maturity and partake of sin. Then we die. Then we're separated from God. As for children, they're safe. Nobody inherits the sins of Adam or of their parents. The lie is that we all inherit the original sin of Adam. The truth is that our just God only holds us accountable for the sins that we individually commit. The lie is that children are in trouble with God and in need of salvation. The truth is that children are in good standing with God, and He hears their prayers. Join us for our next episode, Hell is Real. Targeting Truth Spiritual GPS So you know you have a problem with sin. You're an accountable adult, and you've fallen for Satan's lies. You're separated from God, and you know that he doesn't hear your prayers. What happens if you die in this condition? Do you just cease to exist? Or do you go to hell? It doesn't matter what I say, and it doesn't matter what you feel. The only thing that matters is what God says. So what does the Bible say? Romans 6.23 says, For the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. Notice that in this context, death is contrasted with eternal life. In other words, the inspired Apostle Paul is talking about eternal death. Notice also that the scripture speaks of the wages of sin. Wages are payment that we have earned for what we've done. There is a penalty for sin, and this penalty is something that we have earned, something that we deserve. Consider for a moment what eternal death really means. At its most basic level, this death is separation from God. Where there is no God, there is no good. Where there is no God, there is no love. Where there is no God, there is no light. Can you imagine being in a place absent of all that is good, with no love, with no light, forever? 
I remember as a child going on a field trip to the Lewis and Clark Caverns. At one point in the tour, they shut off all the lights. It was pitch black. It was so dark that when I put my hand right in front of my face, I couldn't see it. I couldn't see anything at all. I remember thinking that I would never want to be alone in that kind of dark for any amount of time. Reports from subjects of interrogation camps indicate that a person begins to lose sanity after 48 hours in total darkness. Imagine the insanity that would come from being in the darkness forever, knowing that there is no possible way out. How about eternal loneliness? I know that I sometimes want to be alone, but I don't want to be lonely. I personally can't imagine life without any other human interaction. Recent experiments conducted by a clinical psychologist tested six volunteers in a solitary, soundproof environment for a span of 48 hours. All of the test subjects experienced anxiety, paranoia, hallucination, and mental deterioration. Who would want to spend eternity all alone? We need to listen to Jesus when he speaks about people who die while in their sin. Eleven times in the gospel accounts, Jesus spoke of hell. Jesus said that hell is a place where the fire is not quenched. Hell is real, and it is certain for those who die in sin. Jesus said in Matthew 25, 46, that the unrighteous will go away into eternal punishment. Did you catch that? Jesus said eternal punishment. That means forever, and forever is a really long time. Jesus once asked a very important question about hell. He asked the Pharisees, how will you escape the sentence of hell? That same question should be asked of each one of us. How will you escape the sentence of hell? The reality is that the punishment for sin is eternal damnation. God is upfront about this and uses this reality to wake us up so that we'll do something about our problem. Proverbs 9.10 tells us that the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. Before we can solve this problem of sin, every one of us must come to grips with our current condition and the penalty we face on the day of judgment. We need to drop our pride and turn to the Savior. Jesus, speaking of himself as the chief cornerstone, said in Matthew 21.44, and he who falls on this stone will be broken to pieces, but on whomever it falls, it will scatter him like dust. In other words, we must willingly break ourselves on the rock of Jesus. If we refuse to do that in our time on earth, we will be crushed at Christ's return. The lie is that it is no big deal if you aren't a Christian. The lie is that if you die in sin, you might miss out on heaven, but there's no such thing as hell. The truth is that hell is real, and it is forever. The truth is that Jesus says that all the unrighteous will enter into eternal punishment. I have one closing question. What is it on earth that's worth going to hell for? Join us for our next episode. The gospel is good news. Targeting Truth Spiritual GPS When we started our series on spiritual GPS, we asked a few questions. Where am I? What is my current location? And where am I going? What is my intended destination? We've briefly spoken about our intended destination of heaven. We've established that Jesus is the only way to get there. As Jesus told Thomas, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father but through me. We've also spoken of the tragic problem of sin in our lives and the consequential dilemma of our separation from God. We've seen the truth that hell is real, and if we leave our problem of sin unresolved, that hell will be our destination. When we check our spiritual GPS, it's warning us that we need to reroute. Somehow we have to get back on track so that we are headed for heaven rather than hell. Thankfully, the Bible brings us the gospel. Gospel is one of those religious words, but it simply means good news. What is that good news? The good news is that Jesus can rescue us and get us back on the track to heaven. Paul told the Corinthians that they were saved by the gospel. He then went on to detail certain aspects of the gospel. In 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 3 and 4, Paul said, For I delivered to you as of first importance what I also received, that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, 
and that he was buried, and that he was raised on the third day, according to the scriptures. The seeds of the gospel were planted way back in the Old Testament. In God's foreknowledge, he previewed the coming sacrifice of Jesus with the deliverance of the Israelites from slavery in Egypt. For the last of the ten plagues, God said that he would destroy the firstborn male of both man and beast in Egypt. The only way that the Israelites could avoid this death plague was through the Passover lamb. God told them to kill an unblemished lamb and then to sprinkle the blood over the door of their house. In Exodus 12, 13, God said, When I see the blood, I will pass over you. Jesus Christ is the fulfillment of that Passover lamb. John the Baptist said of Jesus, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Just as death did not enter the Israelite house where the blood of the Lamb was sprinkled, so death cannot touch the soul of the one on whom the blood of Jesus has been sprinkled. Why is the blood of Christ so powerful that it can deliver us from the very pits of hell and take us on the path straight to heaven? There are a few key points we must consider concerning the blood of Jesus. First of all, it's very important to understand that there is a price that must be paid for our sins. Our holy and righteous God cannot be in the presence of sin. When we sinned against God, we created a debt that we could never repay ourselves. As the prophet Micah asked in Micah 6, 6 through 7, with what shall I come to the Lord and bow myself before the God on high? Shall I come to him with burnt offerings, with yearling calves? Does the Lord take delight in thousands of rams, in 10,000 rivers of oil? Shall I present my firstborn for my rebellious acts, the fruit of my body for the sin of my soul? We understand that we can never pay enough to cover for our sins, yet the debt must be paid. We also can quickly recognize that the Old Testament animal sacrifices are insufficient to pay for our sins. Animals are amoral creatures. In other words, they don't know the difference between good and evil. Animals also don't willingly offer themselves, so their blood cannot possibly cleanse our conscience. As Hebrews 10.4 says, For it's impossible for the blood of bulls and goats to take away sins. In order for us actually to be able to have a clean conscience, we must consciously think this through, and it has to make sense. Consider this analogy. I'm $100,000 in debt, and I have no means to repay. I cannot pay my debt by printing up some counterfeit. As soon as I'm found out, I am in even more trouble. But let's say I have a friend who I know has a stash of a few hundred grand of cold cash. When my friend's out of town, I let myself in and help myself to $100,000 and go pay off my debt. Again, my debt's never actually paid because as soon as I am caught, I'm both in debt and in jail. However, if my friend hears of my predicament and willingly pays my debt, now I am free. Jesus is the only one who can pay the debt of sin. In Jesus' life on earth, he was a free moral creature. He was tempted in all things just as we are. Yet Jesus never sinned, not even once. Jesus certainly has the means to pay our debt, and Jesus willingly chose to do that on our behalf. This is such good news that Jesus died for our sins, that Jesus paid the price in full. There is a way out from guilt. There is a way to get back on the path to heaven. And that way is Jesus. The lie is that we are forever trapped in sin and that there is no escape. The truth is that Jesus paid the price for our sins so that we can truly be free. Join us for our next episode, What Must I Do? Part 1, Conditions, Context and Covenants. Targeting Truth Spiritual GPS. As we continue our series on spiritual GPS, we continue to check the Bible, since it is our divine source of directions. We've seen the serious problem that sin separates us from God, and that if we leave this problem unresolved, that hell will be our destination. However, we've also seen the gospel, the good news that Jesus paid the price in full for our sins, the good news that we can have a clean conscience and have our fellowship with God restored. When we further consider this topic of salvation, there are a few more questions that we need to ask. 
The first question is this, for whom did Jesus die? The answer is obvious. Jesus died for everyone. As 1 John 2, 2 says, and he himself is the propitiation for our sins, and not for ours only, but also for those of the whole world. Now the follow-up question, is everybody saved? Again, the answer is obvious. Of course not everybody is saved. As Jesus said in Matthew 7, 14, for the gate is small and the way is narrow that leads to life, and there are few who find it. Clearly, if Jesus died for everybody, but not everyone is saved, then there must be conditions for salvation. So the logical question comes, what must I do to be saved? Thankfully, this question was asked and answered in the New Testament. But before we charge into finding that answer, there are a couple of important preliminary principles that we must understand. First of all, it's essential that we understand the importance of context in examining all pertinent scriptures on a subject. Hopefully this joke illustrates the point. There was a man who was ready to end his life, but he decided to consult the scriptures first. He just flipped his Bible open, and the passage he read said, and he went away and hanged himself. The man thought, I need to try this again. This time the passage he read said, go and do the same. The man considered this and thought, the third time has to be the charm. And he read, what you do, do quickly. Now certainly the Bible doesn't promote suicide. Yet a person could falsely come to that conclusion without reading the scriptures in context and in their entirety on a subject matter. On a serious note of putting all the scripture together, consider quickly the example of the sign on the cross above Jesus at his crucifixion. Mark's gospel reports that the sign said, the king of the Jews. Luke's account, this is the king of the Jews. Matthew's gospel, this is Jesus, the king of the Jews. Finally, John's account, Jesus the Nazarene, the king of the Jews. John also gave us some extra information that this was written in Hebrew, Latin, and in Greek. In order to get the totality of the inscription above the cross, we must put all of the accounts together. When we do this, we see that the sign said, this is Jesus the Nazarene, the king of the Jews. Notice that not one of the gospel accounts gives us the entirety of the inscription, yet they are each individually accurate. We don't cut out or throw away any of the gospel accounts. Rather, we put them all together. This is an important principle in our approach to the whole of Scripture. As Psalm 119, 160 says, the sum of your word is truth. One final principle that we must understand is the point at which the new covenant actually came into effect. Our Bible is separated into two main sections, the Old Testament and the New Testament. The Old Testament consists of 39 books, beginning with Genesis and ending with Malachi. The New Testament has 27 books, beginning with Matthew and ending with Revelation. We understand that the conditions for our salvation will be given under the New Testament that Jesus inaugurated. However, it isn't as simple as just looking in the book of Matthew forward. The reality is that when Jesus was on earth, he was transitioning from the Old Testament to the New Testament. In other words, he brought New Covenant teachings, but the terms of the New Covenant were not yet in effect. Thankfully, the scriptures establish for us the point at which the conditions of the New Covenant became binding. Hebrews 9, 16 and 17 says, For where a covenant is, there must of necessity be the death of the one who made it. For a covenant is valid only when men are dead, for it's never in force while the one who made it lives. A quick comparison shows that where the New American Standard Version says covenant, the King James Version says testament, and the New International Version says will. In our day, the concept of a will is easiest to understand. Let's say my dad has a will that leaves his library to me. Can I go and start taking books out of his library right now because I have seen the will? No, it's only after my dad dies that the will comes into effect. Only after his death are the books mine. A related point, my dad, while living, can give any books that are in his library to whomever he wants, however he wants. Let's relate this to Jesus and to the salvation that he gives. When Jesus was on earth, he could pass out forgiveness of sins 
in a similar way that my dad can give out the books of his library. A good example of this is when Jesus healed the paralytic. As Jesus said in Mark 2, 10 and 11, But in order that you may know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins, he said to the paralytic, I say to you, rise, take up your pallet, and go home. The point is clear. Jesus had authority on earth to forgive sins. But what about now that Jesus has died, risen again, and ascended to heaven? Will he show up in your room tonight and whisper in your ear that your sins are forgiven? Not a chance. Forgiveness of sins will now be given in accordance with the terms of the new will, the New Testament. So for us to find the answer to the question, what must I do to be saved? We must look in the New Testament following the death of Christ. In other words, we should look in the book of Acts forward. The lie is that there are no conditions for salvation. The lie is that context doesn't really matter, that cut and paste Christianity is okay. The lie is that the new covenant took effect at the beginning of the Gospels. The truth is that there are conditions for salvation. The truth is that context really does matter. We need to find all that the scripture has to say about a topic. The truth is that the new covenant came into effect following the death of Christ. Join us for our next episode, What Must I Do? Part 2, The Conditions. Targeting Truth, Spiritual GPS. In our series on spiritual GPS, we've determined to use the Bible as our divine source of directions. The Bible pinpoints our current location, and it also tells us exactly how to get to our intended destination of heaven. We have seen in the gospel that Jesus paid the price for our sins so that we can once again be in fellowship with God. However, we've also seen that there are conditions necessary for salvation. God's reached out to us through Jesus Christ, but there is a necessary response on our end for us to be saved. Today we want to look at an overview of the conditions for salvation. But before we proceed, let's have a quick reminder of two foundational principles. We've established that we must read the Bible in context and put together all the scriptures on a particular topic in order to arrive at the proper conclusion. We've also established that the new covenant didn't come into effect until after the death of Jesus. For example, remember the thief on the cross that Jesus forgave? Jesus promised that thief that he would be with Jesus in paradise. Although this is recorded in Luke chapter 23, we know that the new covenant wasn't yet in effect when Jesus forgave the thief, because Jesus hadn't yet died when he made that promise to him. As we search the New Testament for the terms of salvation, we must look at conditions following Jesus' death. In other words, we must examine the book of Acts and thereafter. To find the New Testament conditions for salvation, today let's examine four conversion examples from the book of Acts. Our first example comes from Acts chapter 16, verses 16 through 34. While Paul and Silas were in Philippi, they got thrown into prison for casting out the evil spirit of a slave girl. While in prison, Paul and Silas kept great attitudes as they were praying and singing hymns to God. At about midnight, an earthquake rocked the building, opening doors and unfastening the chains of the prisoners. The jailer assumed the prisoners had escaped and he was about to kill himself. But Paul cried out, telling the jailer not to harm himself. The jailer called for lights, rushed in before Paul and Silas, and asked a very important question. He asked, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? Their reply is recorded in Acts 16.31. Believe in the Lord Jesus, and you shall be saved, you and all your household. This is a very straightforward response. The jailer was told that he must believe in the Lord Jesus. Let's consider for a moment. Was the Philippian jailer under the Old or New Covenant? He was under the New Testament, of course, for Jesus had already died. So are we under the same terms? Yes, we are also under the New Testament. So can anybody be saved without believing in Jesus? Nope. What was required for the jailer is what's also required for us today. So we find that the first condition of salvation is that we must believe in Jesus. Our second example takes place 15 years earlier 
than the events in Philippi. Recorded in Acts chapter 2, it's the first time that the gospel was preached in its entirety. In other words, this was the first time that the terms of the New Testament were publicly made known. This was the first reading of the will, the first reading of the conditions of salvation under the New Testament. On the day of Pentecost in AD 30, Peter and the other apostles preached the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ, as recorded in Acts 2, verses 22 through 39. Peter proved that Jesus was the fulfillment of the Old Testament prophecies of the Messiah. Peter summarized his message, saying in Acts 2.36, Therefore let all the house of Israel know for certain that God has made him both Lord and Christ, this Jesus whom you crucified. After hearing this, some were pierced to the heart and asked, Brethren, what shall we do? Peter responded in Acts 2.38, Repent, and let each of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Although these people asked the same question of Peter that the Philippian jailer asked Paul, the response was different. Notice that Peter didn't tell them to believe in Jesus. Does this nullify the need to believe? Of course not. Peter had already preached Jesus as the Christ, so the people asking the question already believed. Peter gave them the next step necessary for salvation. He told them to repent. Let's consider again, were those listening on the day of Pentecost under the Old or New Testament? They were under the New Testament because Jesus' death had already taken place. Are we under the same terms? Yes. Therefore, nobody can be saved without repentance. So we see that the conditions for salvation include not only belief, but also repentance. Our third conversion example is found in Acts 8, verses 26 through 40. God sent a preacher named Philip to meet an Ethiopian eunuch who was on his return trip after worshiping in Jerusalem. This man was in his chariot reading from the prophet Isaiah. The eunuch didn't understand what he was reading, so Philip explained it to him. Acts 8.35 tells us that Philip opened his mouth, and beginning from this scripture, he preached Jesus to him. The Ethiopian then saw water, and he wanted to be baptized. Acts 8.37 records, And Philip said, If you believe with all your heart, you may. And he answered and said, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. The necessity of confessing Jesus Christ is confirmed in Romans 10, 9, and 10. That if you confess with your mouth Jesus as Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart a person believes, resulting in righteousness, and with the mouth he confesses, resulting in salvation. Was the eunuch under the new covenant? Yes, his conversion also follows Jesus' death. So are we under the same terms? Yes, we are. So nobody can be saved apart from confession that Jesus is Lord. We now see that the terms of salvation under the New Testament include belief, repentance, and confession that Jesus is Lord. Our final conversion example is found in Acts 22, verses 1 through 16. This is the Apostle Paul's inspired recounting of his conversion from when he was Saul, the enemy of Christ. We find that Saul was on his way to Damascus to arrest Christians for the purpose of bringing them back to Jerusalem as prisoners to be punished. However, on his way, a bright light flashed from heaven, blinding him and causing him to fall to the ground. He heard a voice from heaven saying, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? He then asked, Who are you, Lord? The divine response was, I am Jesus the Nazarene, whom you are persecuting. He then asked, What shall I do, Lord? Saul was then told to go on into Damascus, where he would be given further instructions. Saul obeyed and went on into Damascus, where we know from other passages that he went three days without food or water. Most people think of Saul's conversion as actually taking place on the Damascus road. But if this was the case, then his sin should have all been taken away on that Damascus road. Please ask a few questions with me. Did Saul believe? while on the Damascus road? Yes, he clearly became a believer 
while on the Damascus Road? Did Saul repent while on the Damascus Road? He clearly had a change of thinking and became willing to do God's will as shown by his three-day fast. Did Saul confess Jesus as Lord while on the Damascus Road? Yes, once he figured out that the one speaking to him was Jesus, Saul called him Lord when asking him what to do. Yet even after believing, repenting, and confessing Jesus as Lord, Saul still had the problem of his sins. God sent a man named Ananias to come to Saul. And in Acts 22, 16, Ananias said to him, Now, why do you delay? Get up and be baptized and wash away your sins, calling on his name. In order for Saul to get his sins washed away, he had to be baptized. Was Saul under the terms of the New Testament? Yes, Saul's conversion followed the death of Christ. Are we under the same terms today? Absolutely. So can anybody be saved without being baptized? Not a chance. When looking at all four of these conversion examples, we find that for a person to be saved, he must believe in Jesus, repent of his sins, confess Jesus as Lord, and be baptized into Christ. The lie is that there are no conditions for salvation. The lie is that all you have to do is believe. The truth is that there are conditions for salvation. The truth is that you must believe, repent, confess Jesus as Lord, and be baptized in order to be saved. Join us for our next episode, What Must I Do, Part 3. What is scriptural belief? Targeting, Targeting truth. truth. Spiritual GPS. As we continue to move forward on our journey of spiritual GPS, we continue to look at the Bible as our source of directions to get to our intended destination of heaven. So far we've seen the problem of sin, the serious nature that sin separates us from God, that it creates a barrier that we could never pay back. We can never uh, close that gap on our own. But we've also seen the good news, that Jesus died for our sins, that he paid the price that we could never pay, that he's willing to bring us back into fellowship with God. We've also seen that there's a response required on our end for salvation, that we must believe, repent, confess Jesus as Lord, and be baptized in order to be saved. Today we're going to shift gears a little bit. We're going to begin to key in on each of these conditions separately. And so today we're going to start with the topic of belief. In Acts chapter 16, the Philippian jailer asked a really important question. He said, what must I do to be saved? And the response came back in Acts chapter 16, verse 31. Paul and Silas said, believe. Believe in the Lord Jesus and you will be saved. So since belief is the first condition for salvation, we want to ask ourselves, what, what does that really mean? What is scriptural faith? What is scriptural belief? You know, in our very first episode of Targeting Truth, we established that faith is more than a feeling, that faith can't just be a blind leap, that it has to be based on something solid. And so we see that biblical faith is not just an emotional uh, response to some tugs of guilt. Biblical faith isn't a reaction to some personal experience that we've had. Rather, scriptural faith is something that's based on evidence. It's a well-reasoned belief that's based on evidence. And the Bible defines faith for us. In Hebrews chapter 11, verse 1, it says, Now faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. Faith's assurance. It isn't just a, a wishful hope. It's a sure thing. Faith is conviction. It's not just a, a preference, but rather it's a conviction. It's a deeply rooted belief that we know to be true. The New King James Version of Hebrews 11 one says it just a little bit differently. It says, now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. See, faith is substance. It isn't just a blind leap. It's based on something solid. Faith is evidence of things not seen. Even though we can't see it in the material realm, there's evidence for it. 
a matter of fact, we know there's actually proof that the Bible is the Word of God. And so today we want to ask ourselves, hey, how do I get this conviction? How do I get this assurance? It's interesting. The New Testament was written in Greek. And there's a Greek word from which both the words faith and belief are derived. And that Greek word is pistuo. There's another English word that's associated with that word, and that is our word persuade. What I'm driving at here is that you can't just will yourself to believe something. You have to be persuaded by information. You have, As you get facts, as you bring in information, you can be persuaded and your, and your mind can change. A belief can be formed. For example, for illustrative purposes, in my Let's say I told you that I will give you a million dollars under one condition. There's one catch. You have to believe that I have in the backyard of my house in in Billings, Montana, I have a real living polka dotted unicorn. Now, there's a challenge here. There's a problem. Because as much as you want that million dollars, you can't receive it. Because you can't just will yourself to believe something that you know not to be true. You know that unicorns are mythological creatures, and so you can't just make yourself believe that. But for illustrative purposes, let's say that over the past 20 years, National Geographic had been running some articles, and they've said, we found that actually unicorns do exist, and that they live on the plains of eastern Montana. Maybe there's some episodes of Discovery Channel or Animal Planet where there's real live video footage of these unicorns and they don't have a stripe pattern like a zebra but they have a polka dotted pattern now after seeing all that evidence you could begin to believe at least in the possibility that i have that unicorn in my backyard we're going to take this and and apply it spiritually a little bit in romans chapter 10 verse 17 it says faith comes from hearing and hearing by the word of Christ. We know that the Bible's accurate. We've proven the Bible's the word of God. And so whatever the Bible says goes. We're not talking about Animal Planet or Discovery Channel or National Geographic. We are talking about the word of God. And so when the Bible says something, when the Bible gives us information, we know that information's true. There's a point here that I can't overemphasize. When when the Philippian jailer asked, he said, what must I do to be saved? And the response came back to believe. The very next verse tells us that Paul and Silas spoke the word of the Lord to him, together with all who were in his house. The point is that the Philippian jailer couldn't believe until he first heard information, scriptural information, about the identity of Jesus. Saving belief only comes from believing in exactly who the Bible says Jesus is. You can't believe in a Jesus that's different in any way from the Jesus revealed in the scriptures and be saved. For example, you can't believe in the false portrayal of Jesus by the Mormons and be saved. That faith won't save you. You can't believe in a distorted or limited view of Jesus what you get from television or the movies, that faith won't save you. You can't believe in a Jesus of your own imagination. That faith won't save you. The only saving faith comes from believing in Jesus as he's revealed in the scriptures. So that leads us to ask, well, who is Jesus? The Bible has a lot to say about him. And today I just want to hit a few of these main points that that are driven home from the scriptures. First of all, we know that Jesus is the promised Messiah, the one who's prophesied in the Old Testament. Jesus is the Savior, the one who saves us from our sins. He's the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the whole world. Jesus is the risen Lord, the one who's been raised from the dead on the third day, according to the scriptures. Jesus is the one who's been exalted to God's right hand as a prince and a Savior. He's the great I Am. The one who is, who was, and who is to come. In simple terms, Jesus is both Lord and Christ. Only you know if you have this faith. Nobody else can give it to you. I can show you facts, 
and you can be persuaded, but you have to check it out. You got to be willing to do the research. I would suggest turn off the TV and get out the good book. Put down your phone and go to the source. If you're convinced the Bible is the Word of God, you've seen the, the prophecies of Jesus, and you've checked out the Bible, you know that the signature of God is on every page of this book. But you need to know more about Jesus. I suggest starting in the Gospels. Open the Gospel of Matthew and read it. Study the Gospel of John. There's some things you're going to find out. You're going to find out not only is Jesus who He claims to be, but Jesus knows you. He knows your heart. Jesus told his friend Martha in John chapter 11, verses 25 and 26. He said, I am the resurrection and the life. He said, he who believes in me will live even if he dies. And everyone who lives and believes in me will never die. And then he asked her a very important question. And he asks you and me that same question today. He said, do you? believe this. There's one other important point that I want to drive home before we leave this topic of belief. And that is that faith always brings about a response. Faith always produces action. If we believe, we do. We know that works don't save. But the flip side of that is that faith always produces works. Romans chapter 16 Verses 25 and 26 tells us that the gospel, the preaching of Jesus Christ, leads to obedience of faith. The bottom line is that if we believe in Jesus, we will do what he says. The lie is that faith is just a blind leap. The lie is that belief is based on emotional experience. The lie is that any belief in Jesus will do. The lie is that belief is simply a mental acknowledgement that no response is required. The truth is that scriptural belief is based on solid evidence. The truth is that real faith comes from biblical facts. The truth is that saving faith comes from believing in Jesus as he's revealed in the scriptures. The truth is that real faith always produces obedience. Join us for our next episode, What Must I Do? Part 4, Scriptural Repentance. Targeting Truth, Spiritual GPS. Today we continue to look at God's plan of salvation as revealed in the Bible. We've seen the problem of sin, but lately we've been focusing on the good news, the gospel. The fact that Jesus died for our sins, that he rose again, that he ascended into heaven, and that he is alive forevermore. We've looked at the new covenant, that there are conditions for salvation. We've seen four conditions. We must believe, repent, confess Jesus as Lord, and be baptized in order to be saved. Last time we keyed in on the topic of belief, and today we're going to shift to the second one. We're going to look at repentance. In Acts chapter 2, on the day of Pentecost, uh, Peter's preaching to the Jews there on the day of Pentecost, and he's laid out Jesus' crucifixion, his resurrection, and he comes to the end of his message, and he says, in Acts chapter 2, verse 36, he says, Therefore let all the house of Israel know for certain that God has made him both Lord and Christ, this Jesus whom you crucified. When they heard this, they were pierced to the heart. And they said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, Brethren, what shall we do? There's that question again. What shall we do? And this time, the response that comes back from Peter, Peter tells them to repent. He says, Repent, and let each of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. So in answer to their question about salvation, Peter told them to repent. Jesus said something similar. In Luke chapter 13, verse 3, Jesus said, Unless you repent, you will all likewise perish. If we're told that repentance is necessary for salvation, then we better know, what is scriptural repentance? Personally, I've asked hundreds of people over the years, what does repentance mean? 
and I've received multiple answers. Probably the most common answers that I've received are along the lines of, I'm sorry, or asking for forgiveness. Every once in a while, I've got one that's maybe a little more along the lines of penance, you know, trying to punish yourself for the bad deeds that you've done. And some people do that. They want to, they lash themselves or they climb 2,000 concrete stairs to repent for the sins that they've committed in the past year. But that's not repentance. That's more like Catholic penance. Other people, they get hammered on Saturday night. And then they come to God on Sunday saying, I'm sorry, God, I'm sorry. But then they repeat the cycle all over again next week. That's not repentance either. That's just sorrow. None of these are scriptural repentance. And so we want to ask, what's God's definition of repentance? If repentance is so important that we can't be saved without it, then we'd better know what God means by it. We've talked before about how the New Testament was written in Greek. And the Greek word for repentance is metanoia. Metanoia literally means change your mind. Repentance, in a literal sense, means to to change your mind, to change the way you think. In the common vernacular, we might say, get rid of your stinking thinking. Certainly, there are details to change in our life. Before we become Christians, there are many things that that we're going to have to change in order to bring our thinking and our actions into line with those of God's. But today I want to start in a big picture sense. I want to talk about repentance, meaning to change your world view. If we start with our world view and we change that, then we can go to work on the details and the details will begin to fall into place. Honestly, most of us haven't put a lot of thought into our world view. We've caught it like someone catches the common cold. Worldview is very contagious. In our worldview, we subconsciously formed from adopting it from people around us, maybe from our parents, from our siblings, from our good friends, from people that we went to school with, from media, social media, etc. Our worldview is something that we've adopted. Repentance means admitting that the world's perspective is wrong and that God's perspective is right. It means acknowledging that that my ways are wrong and God's way is right. Trading in my thoughts for God's thoughts. I have an example of a Bible study that I had with a young lady and her brother many years ago. And we had gone through the gospel and and we're kind of getting to this, this part about repentance. And she told me, she said, I believe the Bible, Luke, but I don't agree with it. And I was like, did I catch that right? You know, maybe, maybe I didn't quite understand what she said. I asked her to repeat it, and so she did. She said, word for word, the same thing. She said, I believe the Bible, but I don't agree with it. And it hit me. She acknowledged that the Bible was true. She could see it up there on that bookshelf and say, yeah, I, I know that the prophecies are in there, and, and I can see that that's true and that it's God's word. But she wasn't willing to change. She wasn't willing to repent. She wasn't willing to bring her thinking, her beliefs, to mold those to match the Bibles. So, as we talk about repentance, we need to not only acknowledge the Bible is true, but we must agree with it. God gives an excellent example of repentance to the city of Nineveh in the book of Jonah. The Lord told Jonah, he said, go to Nineveh and cry against its wickedness. Jonah didn't want to do that, and so instead he jumped on board a ship going the opposite direction. Eventually, Jonah was swallowed by a big fish and then was spit up and onto dry land. And once he hit dry land, he decided he should go to Nineveh and do what God told him to do. And so he went there and went through the city proclaiming, Yet forty days, and Nineveh will be overthrown. The people of Nineveh actually believed God. They, they heard this message, and they took that warning to heart. And Jonah chapter 3, verse 10 tells us that when God saw their deeds, that they turned from their wicked way, then God relented. Notice that God didn't relent until he saw their deeds. Jesus called this change in deeds repentance. In Matthew chapter 12, verse 41, 
Jesus said, The men of Nineveh shall stand up with this generation at the judgment, and shall condemn it, because they repented at the preaching of Jonah. Jesus' definition of repentance is what's important, and he clearly teaches that repentance is a change in behavior. So we can put the meaning of the word metanoia, meaning change the mind. We can put that meaning together with its use in the scripture. And we can come up with a catchy definition of repentance. Repentance is a change in mind, which results in a change in action. If there is no change in behavior, there was no real change of mind. The other side of this, there's no long-term change in behavior without a true change in our thinking. For example, think about a drug addict. People who are addicted to drugs have gone into a treatment center for recovery. And most of them, they come out of that recovery center and they go right back to their old behavior. Maybe they were in there for 40 days. And even though that physical addiction was broken in that 40 days, they go back to their old behavior because there was never a true change in their thinking. I have two sayings that I think pretty well sum up what repentance is all about. The first comes from an acquaintance of my dad. This man had been an alcoholic for years, and then he had overcome that addiction, become a Christian, and become a very successful businessman. And on the front of his business card, he, he had this saying. It said, if you continue to think like you've always thought, you'll continue to get what you've always got. And then you flip the card over and it said on the back of it, is that what you want? The second saying is a follow-up to that, coined by my brother Matt. And he said, he just took it to that next step, to the change of behavior. He said, if you continue to do what you've always done, you'll continue to lose when you could have won. And each one of us has to ask ourselves this question. Is that what we want? Do we want to go on losing? Do we want to go on sinning? Or do we want to win? Do we want to overcome? Do we want to share God's holiness? Many people have the concept that repentance is merely sorrow for past mistakes. But Paul makes it clear in the scripture that this is not the case. 2 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 10 says, for sorrow, that's according to the will of God, produces a repentance without regret, but the sorrow of the world produces death. I want to illustrate this scripture by contrasting Judas and Peter. In the night that Jesus was crucified, both Judas and Peter sinned. You remember Judas betrayed Jesus, and, and later, you know, Judas was sorry for what he'd done. He was terribly sorry. And he saw that Jesus had been condemned. And Judas went and he told the chief priests and the elders, he said, I've sinned by betraying innocent blood. And their response to him was basically, hey, that's your problem, not ours. Judas threw the money back and then he went out and hanged himself. Judas was sorry, but that sorrow was sorrow from the world. And that sorrow resulted in death. In contrast to that, remember Peter uh, Peter and Jesus had a conversation, and Peter told him, he said, I will never fall away. And Jesus told him, he said, Peter, this very night, before a rooster crows twice, you will deny me three times. And as the events unfolded, as Peter saw that Jesus was, was taken away into trial, Peter did end up denying Jesus three times, ultimately uh, denying that he even knew him. Was Peter sorry for what he had done? Yeah, he was. You know, when the scripture tells us that after that rooster crowed a second time, that Jesus looked across the courtyard at him, their eyes met, and then Peter went out and wept bitterly. But that wasn't the end for Peter. Peter repented. Three days later, Peter is at the empty tomb. Peter ended up getting to see Jesus after he'd been raised from the dead and went on to be a great apostle spreading the gospel of Jesus Christ throughout the world. Sorrow can produce repentance, but mere sorrow is not repentance. From the Bible, we conclude that repentance, it's a change in attitude, a change in thinking that results in a change in our behavior. 
if there is no change, then there's no real repentance. Now, I want to be clear about something. You don't have to have all the details of your life straightened out before you become a Christian. All of us need God's help to overcome sin. But you do need to agree that God's ways are right and that you're willing to make those changes that are necessary in your life. I think of repentance, it's, it's like signing on the dotted line. You don't have to know all of the fine print because you trust the one who wrote the fine print. And so you sign on that dotted line. As you come to know more about God's character, as you read new information in the scriptures, then you change your thinking to match God's thinking. That's repentance. One final point about repentance. In Acts chapter 2, when Peter told the Jews on Pentecost that they had to repent, that repentance included for them a change in their religion. These Jews had to become true Christians. And many of us, we hold to our religious views very, very strongly. What do we do when we find out that the Bible teaches something differently than what we've believed? If we have true repentance, then we don't try to twist the Bible to make it match my belief. Rather, we remold our thinking to match what God says in His Word. The bottom line is that God's ways are right, no matter how much they contradict what we've been taught. The lie is that all you have to do is believe that no change is required. The truth is that we must repent or we will perish. The lie is that repentance is mere sorrow. The truth is that worldly sorrow ends in death, but godly sorrow produces repentance. The lie is that repentance is simply asking for forgiveness. The truth is that repentance is a change in mind that results in a change in behavior. 